so we're on the next episode of Blood Money. I have Steve Sanson over here from Veterans in Politics. Steve Sanson is a 12-year Army and Marine vet. And after finishing with the Army and Marines, he started his podcast, Veterans in Politics, which talks about topics having to do with corruption, having to do with what's happening in politics. He unearths a lot of interesting topics that you would normally not hear about and definitely things that are not talked about in the mainstream media. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Good. Thanks for having me, Vim. You're one of the most interesting people I've met because there's not many like you. Could you tell us a little brief bio about yourself and what you do? All right. Well, so I, 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 I um, grew up in New York City and I joined the Marine Corps in 85. And um, I'm a Gulf War veteran of the um, of the uh, first Gulf War. Came out of the Marine Corps in 91. Um, joined the Army in 92. And I uh, was on um, active reserves and inactive ready reserves and I came out the army in 1998 but uh, prior to actually coming out of the army um, I came to Vegas in 1995 and uh, what, what got me in politics is that um, um, Aaron Kenny, one of the Clark County commissioners, wanted to put a fire station at the end of my cul-de-sac and uh, it was an empty, empty uh, lot that was slated for um, homes. And according to the master plan, homes were supposed to be there, not the fire station. So, you know, when you buy your property and you look at the master plan and you look at these empty lots and it shows that homes are supposed to be there, you're like, okay, cool. So I'm gonna buy my house, I'm gonna invest. So a couple of years later, all of a sudden, I didn't wanna put a fire station there. So I went to my county commission at the time, which was Aaron Kenny. I'm like, hey, the master plan says homes, why are you putting a fire station there? Why don't you put it on the, the other side of the uh, lot, which would have been Flamingo area? And that, that lot was a lot more pricier. So I guess that's why they wanted to put the fire station there. But anyways, the county commissioner lied um, lied to us and uh, we created a, um, an HOA to go after the county for putting that fire station there. We had over 100 members and um, we paid for a lawyer. We sued the county. We didn't prevail in moving the fire station, but what happened was that um, um, different uh, ordinance that they couldn't do, they couldn't put their, they couldn't put their lights and, and, and sirens on until they were a couple blocks away. So we had different restrictions on them. So that's what actually got me into politics in um, 1998 with, uh, with Las Vegas, Nevada. And then prior to that, and then after that, I um, decided to run for uh, city council back in 2003. And uh, it was a vacated seat that uh, uh, Michael Mack was, uh, was leaving. And I ran against Steve Ross for uh, city council. And um, I didn't prevail in, in the seat, but uh, what happened was, um, I was uh, solicited by the um, president of Veterans and Politics to be their media spokesman in 2004. And then um, in 2005, uh, I was elected president of Veterans and Politics. And since then, I, uh, I created several chapters throughout the state. I created a chapter in Canada. So now we're Veterans and Politics International. And... Uh, to stay, uh, to stay, you know, to stay in the thick of things, we um, decided to create a uh, a uh, show. Uh, it was a video internet show back in 2005. We were on All Talk Radio, and uh, we were on the internet, and uh, we created a show about, you know, seeing what veterans were all about, um, seeing the political climate, um, introducing uh, candidates to the public. And we did that for quite a number of years. Up until today, we're still doing that. And now we're a video internet program. And uh, the, the whole premise of, of the program is to educate the public on candidates running for elected seats, on um, um, court corruption, on uh, police corruption. So we have a whole array of, of items that, uh, that we cover. But the three branches of Veterans and Politics International is to, <clears throat> first branch is to, um, uh, is to legislate uh, for, um, for laws that are gonna serve the community, um, expose political corruption, and to educate the public on candidates running for elected office. 
and since then we we've been we've been doing it for many many years um we we know the political climate very well um we cover the whole state of nevada we have a chapter in northern nevada as well as southern nevada and uh, i i prim primarily run the uh the southern nevada chapter so that's that's basically it in in a in a nutshell one of the favorite things that I like about what you do is you become a crime fighter, you become a watchdog on corruption. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the individuals that you've dealt with and the wrong doings that they have done uh, and how you've uh, dealt with that sort of thing? Well, back in 2014-15, um, uh, many veterans came to us and said that the family court was in disarray, that they were violating um, their own code of ethics, they're violating um, um, civil procedures, they're violating state and federal laws, and uh, they were getting a raw deal in family court. It wasn't fair, it wasn't transparent, and we, we've put, veterans in politics put a, a lot of those judges on the bench in family court, so it was a little bit difficult to hear when, when uh, litigants came to us and started to um, tell us that uh, that uh, these judges were were just corrupt. So what we did, we we started to um, you know uh, go in the judges' chambers and and generalize and say, hey judge, you know um, you know if you if you sign an order and and the opposing party um, has not uh, uh, um, followed your order, you have to find them in contempt. You know you can't just sign an order and not enforce the order. So basically, those are the those are the chatter for a couple of years, and then more litigants started to come to us as saying how family court was was um, corrupt. So what we did, we started to go into the family court, and we started to court observe. And what happened while doing that, you know, we we knew all the judges. We show up with a shirt. They all recognize us, and it was it was um, you know everything was kosher. After each court hearing, litigants started to come to us and say, you know what, it was a big difference on how the judges respond to us. Their attitude changed. They did a whole 180. So that means they were acting differently when veterans and politics were in the courtroom. So they goes, you know, we're, you're not seeing the, exactly what these judges are doing when you're not here. So we started watching videos and start looking at motions. And then we created a YouTube channel called Veterans and Politics, which has all our podcasts and uh, which has a lot of the court videos. So we started to realize that a lot of these judges were violating um, um, laws and, and federal, state, local laws. They were violating everything. And due process wasn't even in a family courtroom. In fact, they don't even have a jury box. Go figure. So there was one particular judge. Her name is Rena Hughes. And uh, this judge was scolding an 11-year-old child and telling the child that uh, that she was going to go to child haven, it's like jail. I mean, really intimidating this kid, really battering her. While dad and his attorney were sitting in there watching this whole thing unfold, and the judge kicked the mom out of the courthouse. Now she kicked the mom out of the courthouse, not even the courtroom, the actual courthouse. She kicked her out into the parking lot. So mom was representing herself. So now the judge is conducting ex parte communication with dad and his attorney while mom is her own attorney and she kicked mom out the whole courthouse. Took the child, alienated the child from mom. So when I watched this video, I was like, I was shocked. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe um, Rena Hughes would, would do something like that. You know, I, I, was, I was like, you know, beside myself and watching this child cry. So I put it on our YouTube channel. When I put it on YouTube channel, I've, I've had some um, death threats to take it down, which... <laughs> Do you know where those death threats came from, or...? I have no idea. You, you laugh. Tell me about <laughs> why you laugh. <laughs> because I, I, I'm the type of guy, you don't threaten somebody's life. If you're going to go take a life, you just go take it. You don't go and threaten it. You don't warn them. You just do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that, that's, that's how I was raised, you know? So <clears throat> I laughed about it and um, I started protesting the family court because I found a whole lot of other things going on. I started protesting the family court. But then back to Rena Hughes. <sighs> so 
We filed a judicial disciplinary complaint against Rene Hughes, and I advised mom to do the same, and mom did. And the judicial discipline took strong action because the media got a hold of the video now. So now it was on channel 13, 8, 5, you know. So the media got a hold of it and really, really broadened the horizons on viewers watching this little 11-year-old being battered by this big bad judge. So, so they, uh, judicial discipline took the whole case to Reno. I don't know why they did that because, you know, the judge is here in Clark County. But took the whole case to Reno. So I flew mom out to Reno and I went out to Reno and we asked for a um, media, re we did a media request and we filmed the whole judicial discipline complaint um, hearing that lasted a whole day. And we put that on YouTube as well. Anyways, the judicial discipline found mom that um, found that the judge did violate the law and uh, asked and told the judge that she had to go back to um, uh, judicial college. That means when she went the first time, she probably was sleeping. So now she got to go back on her own dime, by the way. It's about five grand, I think. So anyways, uh, uh, Judge Hughes um, decided that she was going to appeal it. And, uh, excuse me, decided that she was going to appeal it and in front of the Supreme Court. Anyways, at the same time, there was an election going on for her retention to that bench. And... Um, she lost in the primary. If now, now Deidre Butler is the one sitting in that seat. Now, if if veterans in politics didn't go after Rena Hughes, Rena Hughes will still be on the bench today. Mm -hmm. But because we did what we did, she's off the bench. So that, that that's just a prime example of of one of the individuals judge that we took off the bench. And and and. And, and there's no such thing as impossible. Things can happen if you use the law to, to benefit what you need to get done. Uh, we connected on this topic because I went through something very similar where uh, there was absolutely no due process, uh, ex parte communications, and a lot of perjury and fraud into the court record. And I wish I had somebody like you and your organization watching over them. Now, why is it that only when there's somebody like you, uh, who I consider a crime fighter, uh, watching that these judges behave. Why is it? Yes. Well, I guess we care about the judicial process. The ju judicial process is huge. And the judicial process put a lot of innocent people behind bars. The judicial process destroys a lot of families. You know, I'm not saying that the, the, the whole judicial process is, is, is bad. I'm just saying when you have bad judges making bad decisions um, against good people, then the judicial process needs a whole, a whole overall. Um, the family court system is absolutely disgusted. Um, it, uh, um, judges use their discretion. They, they bring their own bias to the bench. Um, if you're going to use your discretion, then why need law? You know, why, why you have to follow law if you're going to use discretion? Because discretion is not following law. Why do we send people to Carson City um, to, to um, legislators, assembly, and senate um, to um, 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 legislate law and make law and amend law if you have judges in the courtroom that's going to you know, flip you the middle finger and, and use their own personal bias. And if judges are using their own personal bias, why do you have to be an attorney to run for judge? If you're going to bring good common sense and your own personal discretion to the bench and not, and not look at law at all, I think anybody should be able to run for family court. As long as you have a good head on your shoulder and you can make good, good, good judgment. What other arenas have you worked in in stopping corruption? Well, uh, veterans and politics champion uh, um, uh, the uh, well, we did we did several several items since um, 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 me taking over in two thousand and five. Uh, we also um, got the veterans treatment court. We testify. We help sponsor it. We help write the bill on veterans treatment court. And the veterans treatment court is supposed to help veterans. Um, get get uh, get treatment instead of incarceration so we helped created that back in 2008 and it was signed into law by uh, Governor Jim Gibbons 
and uh, and uh, the Veterans Treatment Court helped a lot of veterans uh, throughout the years ever since it was um, it was uh, proposed and 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 became law. So that's one of the things. The other thing we did was uh, drivers um, on your driver's license. We put veterans on the driver's license. It's optional for veterans to put to put veterans on their driver's license for the state of Nevada. And the reason for that is to de-escalate any type of um, police hostility. If, the, if when a police pulls you over and get your driver's license and he sees veterans on there, for one, he should say, thank you for your service. The other, he might want to have a conversation to say, hey, you know, where did you serve? You know, were you in combat? Just in case some, something goes, you know, crazy, um, that that officer would have a better understanding on who he's dealing with. So that's why we put veterans on the uh, driver's license. In fact, that that whole thing came out from the Stanley Gibson shooting. An unarmed veteran that was in the car. He was suffering from PTSD. He was unarmed, but yet he got gunned down by a uh, uh, Las Vegas police officer who's no longer on the force, by the way. And and that's another thanks to veterans and politics for for doing that. We we took that police officer off off the force. Why is it important? Tell, tell us why it's important to have veterans court, like a specialty court for veterans. You know what? Let me tell you how I, how I summed it up to the district attorney when he was on our podcast. Um, you know, when, when I compare the veterans to uh, a law enforcement officer, um, although their jobs are different, one is search and destroy, depending. Uh, the other one is protect and serve. So when a law enforcement officer draws his weapon and fires his or her weapon, that law enforcement officer is immediately pulled off the street, okay, paid administrative leave, especially if they, they, um, they, they shoot a, a, a perp. Um, so he's pulled off the street, paid administrative leave, okay, and then he goes through psychiatric evaluation. That means he talks to a counselor, and the counselor... You know, after several hours of talking to the counselor, counselor would say, okay, he's fit to go back or she's fit to go back on the street or they're not, they need more counseling. But when a veteran is in combat, veteran shoots his weapon, her weapon, fires it, blows up, IED, you know, grenades, seeing people die, seeing people blow up, have to take lives themselves. They do it every single day. There's no pulling them off the combat zone. There's no going to a counselor to see if they're fit to go back. There is none of that. They're in the fight every single day, every single night. Sometimes one tour, seven months, 12 months, sometimes two tours, another seven to 12 months, sometimes three tours. I have guys that did seven tours. And you think that you're going to bring a veteran after combat? bring him back to civilian society, send him on his way, and he's supposed to be good as golden? He's supposed to blend in with everybody else? Absolutely not. There is no, there is no transition course out of the military into civilian world. I mean, the military takes a civilian, and then they break him down, and they make him into a military person, okay? But there's no opposite direction. There's no, okay, you're military, now we're going to transition, transition you down to become a civilian. So you're going to do an everyday nine to five, you're going to kiss your wife, everything is going to be cool, not that walk your dog, whatever. It is a whole different world, and if you're not in it, you won't understand it. Wow, wow. That's that's a really I mean that's a really clever way of putting it. So do you find a lot of veterans when they come out of the service they have issues reintegrating with society? Absolutely, I did. I I thought I when I came out the Marine Corps, I thought civilians were entitled bunch of assholes, to be honest with you, that don't know the meaning of the American flag. They tell me, "Hey, we, you, we, we, we pay for you guys to go out there and defend our constitutional right to give us the right to come home." back here at home to burn the flag and that's crazy especially when veterans see a whole many of their brothers and sisters that die for the flag and you're going to come home into your own country it's bad enough you go to other countries abroad and watch other countries burn the american flag but what's disgusting and, the, and degrading is when you come to your own country and you got americans that are burning the flag that that is total disrespect they need to be shot
<laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it's taken a lot of restraint for you to put up with the crap that's happening right now in our uh, culture. Absolutely. And it took me a while to deal with civilian the civilian populace because I, I didn't like them at all. I had to go into the army to kind of, um, um, because I was going cold turkey when I left the Marine Corps, especially coming back from Desert Storm, I had to go in the army to kind of <sighs> go down a little bit. It's, it's, like, a, it's like somebody that's, that was used to smoking three packs of cigarettes a day, and now you're going to take away all their smokes. They're going to be having shakes. They're going to be going crazy. Their mood is going to swing and change and go up and down. They're going to be like a roller coaster ride with their emotions. So that's the same thing when you come out of the military, especially when you come out of the Marine Corps and you did combat, or, or if you were in the Army and did combat, or if you were in any branch of the military and did combat, and you come back and all of a sudden the military structure is taken away from you, and you're going to lose your mind. So I had to go into the Army just to get along with civilians. <laughs> because cold turkey wasn't working for me. Wow. So, Steve, what are some of the topics right now in present day that concern you and things that you would like to affect change towards whether individually or whether through veterans and politics like maybe name the top five things that concern you well if if you want to have any type of um um for me for respect for the family court system as a as a um as a judicial body of our government, then we must afford litigants um, jury trials, relocation of children and termination of parental rights. We need jury trials for relocation of children and termination of parental rights as a start. Okay. Or a three or a three uh, panel judge. One person making that decision is ridiculous. One person is is affecting generations of lives for that family one person if you if you relocate children and you terminate parental rights that's a civil death one person should not be able to make that decision all by themselves they need a jury or a three-body judge to do that i think um the second thing is judges judges have uh no um um, they, they're, they're protected by um, 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 judicial immunity. Um, they, you can't recall a judge in the state of Nevada. Um, judges have no term limits. Um, you have, you have uh, attorneys that don't want to run against judges because of repercussion, because they have cases in front of that judge and they don't want to lose um, their cases. You know, this is how these attorneys um, feed their families. And they have cases in other courtrooms that the judges might be friend. If you want to go after this judge and, and take this judge out in, a, in, a, in a, an election process, they might be friends with those other judges that you have case. So attorneys are, are a little bit intimidated or a lot intimidated to run against um, a, a sitting judge. So wh where does that leave you if you have a bad judge that's sitting on the bench? And these, these, these seats are, these terms are six years each before... You go for another re-election. And everybody goes, well, you know, at the ballot box, you get rid of the judge. But you can't get rid of the judge if you have nobody to run against the judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know? You can't get rid of the judge if there's nobody to run against the judge. So where does that leave you? So we, we came up with this thing called remove or retain. So the way it works is that if remove, if remove gets more votes than retain, if, if an incumbent judge, if an incumbent judge makes it to the general election and remove gets more um, votes then retain, the seat is vacated, J the Nevada Judicial Selection Committee comes in, takes applications, uh, sends three names to the governor, the governor picks one of the three names, fill the vacancy, and then, and then um, that person runs for retention the following election year. This is the process that we have in mind to get rid of bad judges off the bench because the Judicial Discipline Commission sucks. They're they not, suck. They're yeah, not yeah, doing... Yeah. Their job, the state bar, getting rid of attorneys, they suck. The state bar is in cahoots with these attorneys. They suck. Yeah. So we need to revamp the Judicial Discipline Commission, and we also need to revamp the state bar of Nevada. How, how often uh, judges' terms are how many years? Six. Six For years. district court and family. So, so this concept basically is when they're up for re-election is when you're able to basically take them out? Right. Okay. 
question here. How does uh, how do, our entire system is based on checks and balances? And how does something <laughs> like family court that has no checks and balances even exist? Because we allow it to happen. Mm. We allow it to happen. And, and, and when we allow it to happen, the, the bad behavior become normalized. Mm -hmm. And what happens is these judges are sealing cases with these attorneys. So when they're sealing cases, which they're not supposed to seal the entire case, but they're doing it anyway, and we're allowing them to get away with it. I mean, the, the, the state law says you cannot, the Nevada Revised Statute says you cannot seal an entire case. Mm -hmm. But we are allowing them to, get, to do it, and, and they're, they're, they're getting over with it. That, that, and and, and the, the thing is, we create these laws, and these judges are not even following the laws, but yet they expect you to follow their orders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Imagine how that works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very uh, authoritarian approach. Hypocritical. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and honestly, it's, it sounds like some stuff that was going on 300 years ago in England when they were oppressing us. And it's, it's odd that this sort of behavior exists. Let me ask you, what makes you personally so passionate about this topic of judicial misconduct, uh, especially in terms of the family court? Well... I had a uh, family court case in California that lasted nine years. Wow, wow. And um, I, I did eventually um, have custody. I was dealing with California, and I'm living in, in Nevada. So, you know, from state, different states, the jurisdiction was a lot different. That's why it took so long. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I finally ended up um, um, having all my kids, and, um, and uh, it was a roller coaster ride for a time. And uh, I, I learned, and I, and I lived with it. But... In the state of Nevada, I have no family court issue. Matter of fact, all these, a lot of these judges were, were um, friends of mine or, or, or acquaintance. And, uh, and I didn't have any problems with them. But I, I cannot sit idly by and watch um, people that we elect, that uh, we endorsed, um, just violate the law without having any kind of repercussion. And and uh, and if you allow if you allow bad citizenry to get away with uh, with bad judgments, bad decisions, and knowingly doing wrong, and we elected them in office, what does that say about us? Mm -hmm. We put them there, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I I'm trying to change that. What makes you so passionate about this? Because obviously doing the work that you do for, with veterans and politics, you're constantly calling out corrupt individuals. You're going after powerful individuals that are well-connected. Obviously that puts you at risk, you know? Uh, you, you've gotten death threats before, uh, as you were saying. I mean, why are you so passionate about doing the kind of work that you do? You know, they say when you enter a place, you're supposed to... Um make it better than how it was when you, you're you supposed to make it better when you leave than when you found it. So that's basically what we're trying to do. I mean, we have to think about the future generation and we have to think about, you know, how, how, how is this going to affect you? What makes me more passionate? I think part of it is that um, I take a lot of my anger and, and a lot of the, the upsetness that happened in my my life and I just put it in the politics instead of putting it in something that's going to get me locked up and go behind bars, <laughs> you know, so I just, I just curve it and I just put it into, and it takes somebody discipline to do that because not everybody could do that. Not everybody could take their anger and their, their, their um, um, ill judgments from life and, and turn it and, and put it into something that's positive. And, and, and direct it that way. It, it takes a different mindset to do that. So instead of me ended up behind bars, I am putting it in politics and, and, and help uh, litigants um, 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 get their children, um, help litigants um, um, have a fair and equal justice. Because I, I don't think justice, justice is supposed to be blind, okay? Justice is not supposed to be okay, um, this person has more money than that person. This person has a better lawyer than that person. Justice is supposed to be blind. Justice is supposed to be fair. And justice is supposed to be transparent. I mean, you, you should be able to see these things out and open, not, not something that's closed be, behind doors that you can't see. 
And that's the problem that we're having here. Um, justice is not blind. Justice is, is about um, who you know, what you know, that friends is good friends of mine, that friends, that, 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 that. And it's a whole big organized conspiracy. That's what I see in the family court. It's not, especially this one, um, contempt proceedings. Uh, a family court judge, a family court judge is a, is a civil judge and not a criminal judge. A criminal judge has contempt proceedings that they can lock you up behind bars because you violated a court order or, or what have you. A family court judge is not supposed to do that. And even if you're going into a contempt proceeding, According to our 14th Amendment, you, you have a right to a fair judiciary. That means you could be represented by counsel. But it doesn't go the same in family court. Um, you show up, you, you're not represented by anybody, and these family court judges are locking you up for contempt. But they don't have jurisdiction to do that. But they're doing it anyway. You know. But a criminal judge has jurisdiction to lock you up for contempt because that's in their preview. But a family court judge does not. In a, in a criminal proceeding, you have a right to a, a jury, um, a right to, um, oh, you do have a right to a jury, and you do have a right to um, legal counsel if you can't afford one. In family court, there is no jury, and there is no legal counsel, so where is your right? Why, why, why does your constitutional right stop at the doorstep of a family courthouse? It's unbelievable. So the judges go, well, that's civil contempt, and this is criminal contempt. There's a difference between civil contempt and criminal contempt. Tell that to a jail cell. When you're locked up behind bars, you think a jail cell knows what's the difference? But oh, he's only here for a civil contempt. We're just going to treat him extra nice. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. That is such crap. Yeah. You know? Your 14th Amendment right is violated, and that's that. Yeah. That's that. It's violated. So I don't know the difference between civil and criminal contempt. The only thing I know is that my freedom was taken away from me. Mm -hmm. That's what I know. Without a jury, without Without like, a jury yeah. and without an attorney, my freedom was taken away from me. What country do we live in? Is family court a different country now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, does it, as a veteran that, you know, went and risked your life and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know thousands of other veterans. I mean, does it, really, does it frustrate you how screwy things have gotten in this country? Let me tell you what frustrates me. When you have attorneys that never even served in the military, you have attorneys that are taken or taken or, or want to take away a veteran service connected disability benefits for the sole purpose of alimony. I think that is fucked up. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. OK, mm -hmm. that is fucked up. You hear me, Marshall Willick? You're a piece of shit. Wow, that's a judge you mentioned? That's an attorney. That's an attorney, wow, wow. What, so what, what are the projects you're currently working on uh, in terms of calling attention to this, in terms of removing other corrupt individuals? What are the you know, things that you're most passionate about today? Well, exposure. Mm -hmm. Exposure is your biggest weapon, okay? And that's why we've been doing these podcasts for years. And that's probably why the family courts try to gag us with these ridiculous gag orders. And oh, yeah. they, they um, I mean, different, different fashions. They try to shut you down. Well, what they try to do is discredit and isolate you. Um, you I had two piece of shit family attorneys, Marshall Willick and Jennifer Abrams, want to sue me for defamation. And these are the two individuals of the biggest defamatory people of them all in the family court mm -hmm. business. But yet they want, I mean, I'm cor of course they should know what defamation is because yeah. they do it all the time on a regular basis. So might as well be the pot calling the kettle black and toss it on somebody else's lap and, and, and project your bullshit onto them. And that's exactly what these are two attorneys did. So they sued me, they sued me for defamation and and I and I won I won the lawsuits. Wow, amazing, amazing. I won, I, and, and the thing I've is, heard... folks, you gotta you gotta keep on. You gotta keep pressing. Yeah. You gotta find. You gotta surround yourself with good people, and you just gotta keep the fight up. Because if you let these people take an inch, they'll take a mile. 
I've heard of Jennifer Abrams, actually. Some of the family court litigants I've talked about have, have said a few things. Allegedly, I say allegedly because I haven't seen it myself, but apparently there's been uh, individuals that are involved in the family court process that have been defamed, that have been come, called abusers, their court records released online. Is that the sort of thing you've yep, also heard? Yep, yep, yep. They created this, this, this Facebook page. I don't even want to give it any credit but it's a piece of shit Facebook page that goes after litigants mm -hmm. and, 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 and puts their private matters out there. So that's what they do. And they, they call, they, these people haven't even called out a judge yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet they're supposed to be court watchers. They mm -hmm. haven't called out a judge. I guess all the judges are doing wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds, uh, what it sounded like to me was a tool of them essentially uh, kissing up, perhaps, to the bad judges in order for things to swing their way. Kind exactly, the, yeah. exactly. You know, the law firms want to win cases, so they yeah. suck a little for the, for the bad judges so, so they could get their cases um, 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 winnable. And it, it's, it's all about the almighty dollar. It's, mm -hmm. it's all about the money. It has nothing to do with... Um, 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 compassion and empathy, um, right and wrong, it has everything to do with how much could I get in my pocketbook. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for those that don't know, I'm just going to throw a little footnote here. You know, this is a $60 billion industry. And for those of us that uh, understand what's going on in family law, it's all about protracting the lawsuits, protracting uh, the court process in order to, you know, just drain you. Right. And uh, uh, to that effect, Steve, w what do you think... Uh, the future holds in terms of what's happening in the d judicial circles and family law? Well, well one, one of the other things I like to see with family court is that when they, when they schedule you to go see a counselor, that that individual could use their own um, insurance and pay copay, mm -hmm. whatever their copay or whatever their deductible might be. I mean, that's why we all have insurance. Not, not to have these court-appointed counselors and psychiatrists and pay ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for it. This is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. It's ridiculous because they're taking money away from these litigants that they could put into their children's educational program. Instead, they're putting it into lawyers' pockets and all these, all these court-appointed um, entities' pockets and keep up the caseload of the, of the courthouse so they could hire more judges and more JAs and more marshals. It's all a big circle of how we could obtain more money and more power. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. And, and you know, uh, again, for those that don't know, I mean, there, there, there's therapists involved in this scam. There, it's like a whole industry of corruption. Would, exactly. would you say that's accurate? That's accurate. Yeah, and uh, you know everybody's making money. They say, "Oh, you got you know you might be a complete normal person, never having committed a crime. All of a sudden, you got to pay ten thousand dollars for a psychiatrist to tell you what your mental state is like. That psychiatrist is really working for the courts in order mm -hmm. to make more money, and it just kind of they keep you in this um, uh, what is it called uh, like war of attrition mm -hmm. uh, until you know you're down to your last penny." So, Steve, uh, there was one more thing. Sure, sure. Family court judges don't follow rule of evidence. Yes. If mom or dad goes in there and said, let's say mom goes in there and said dad is an alcoholic, he drives drunk all the time, then the judge puts these <laughs> things on dad's vehicle without any type of evidence, no 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 arrests, no 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 affidavit from the neighbor. No, no, nothing. Just based on hearsay alone. And all these attorneys that deliberately lie in court, they should be brought up on perjury, they should be sanctioned, and they should be jailed. Do you think any of this is going to change in the near future? I think so. I think if we keep pushing, pushing on, I think that if, if, um, if, if, we, if we bring up the numbers, more people take interest in this, the more exposure it gets, I think people would catch on, and I think things will change. We're patriots. Does this strike you as you know, destroying families, destroying children, traumatizing parents and children? Isn't this the most unpatriotic, uh, almost, I mean, you know, treason's a strong word, but I mean, you are really causing harm to the core of this nation. Well, when you give Child Protective Services caseworker an incentive to take children away from families, I think we have a problem here. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Steve, in, in closing, is there anything you would like to say? Yes, I would like to say that um, why wait till these things come knocking on your door before you take interest? Why wait? Mm -hmm. I, have, I have no dog in this fight in family court. Not one. I don't even have a little chihuahua. <laughs> I have no dog in this fight in family court. I'm taking this on. And my kids are grown, except for my little 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. And she's not going to go anywhere in family court. You best believe that. Mm -hmm. But I have no dog in this fight, and I'm taking on this family court thing. And, and I think the reason is because people can't throw, well, He's just mad at that judge because that judge took his kid or, or he's biased because he's got this big long thing in family court. He's biased. That's why he's taking. No, I have no fight. I have no personal fight in family court. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. And another thing I want to emphasize is this um, vexatious litigant crap. What the heck is that? You got, you got these litigants that, that can't even afford their own counsel. In fact, some of them can't even afford to put gas in their car to get to the family court. But they're, they're there and they're filing all these motions and stuff. Granted, they're not lawyers because we don't have a self-help that really walks them through the process. Okay? Not until my book comes out. Mm -hmm. But they're filing it because they want their child. They're doing it because the love of their child, their child is their DNA, that's their blood, they want their kid, they want to be part of their kid's life, they're filing all these documents, and then you, judges, deem them a vexatious litigant. Tie their hands, take away their 14th Amendment right, now they can't defend themselves, they can't argue their case, they have no, 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 no um, right to get their own documents so they could defend themselves. Their documents are redacted. They can't even see what's on there. And they can't file an emotion, any, any briefs or, or emotions or anything like that. And, and then you deem them vexatious so they can't do a doggone thing. But my question is, why aren't you doing the same thing for all these attorneys that file hundreds and and hundreds of pages and, and all this crap and they, 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 they throw at litigants to, 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 to um, financially cripple them so they can't come back and fight anymore. How come you don't deem the attorneys as vexatious litigants or vexatious attorneys? And they're not doing it for the love of their child. Mm -hmm. They're doing mm -hmm. it for the almighty dollar. Big difference, but yet they're not deemed vexatious. Mm -hmm. And they file way more crap crap um, um especially that marshall willett guy he files crap throws all his shit against the wall to see what stick to see what these judges will bite off on because some of these judges over there are so damn stupid that's why well yeah and you know for people that are you know there's been a lot of things that happened in the last few years you know our uh, rights to our children uh seems to be threatened through the schools they're getting masked uh, we're being told that our opinions and thoughts are domestic terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at an election that a lot of people think that there was fraud involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of this authoritarian behavior. And yes. what, uh, the point I want to make here is for people wondering why all this stuff's happened, when you look at the family court and you see how they've been able to get away with crime after crime and deprivation of rights, you know, once they do that, once they're able to steal their children for profit, what do you think comes next? This is why, just like you were saying, Steve, people have to get involved, even if they don't have children. What's the corruption in family law courts is just an offshoot of everything else that's happening in society. Exactly, because you know what? It, these things are all domino effects. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't catch up with you now, it'll catch up with you later, okay? Mm -hmm. Because because it, we, we really, really need to pay attention to every elected individual, especially the ones that's on our bench or our judicial bench, because these people affect your lives immediately, immediately. A president might take a few years before it affects you, but these judges affect your life immediately. And I'm surprised more and more people are, are, don't take an interest in the judiciary, especially in family court. And it doesn't even have to affect you personally, 
because it could affect your neighbor, your parents, it could affect your grandkids, could affect your future kids that you don't even have. But either way, it will catch up to you sooner or later. Mm -hmm. The thing is, what are you going to do about it now? Mm -hmm. You have to do something about it now. That way, it doesn't. You, you have to stop the bleeding. You can't just put a Band-Aid on there and hope it will stop. You need to have some stitches and stop the bleeding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Steve, thank you so much. You're one of the individuals I admire greatly because um, if there was a Steve Sanson in every state, we would not be in the mess we're in today. Oh, boy. Yep, yep. Boy, if I had one of me in every single state. <laughs> <-wee>. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine what I could do. Yep. <laughs> well, well thank, thank you so much for having me, Vem. I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking an interest in, in, in the veterans and politics and what we do. And uh, we hope that, uh, that uh, this will educate folks to start standing up for their rights. And, and to exercise every one of their constitutional rights. There's a lot of constitutional rights, folks. And, 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 and I'm telling you, you guys need to go and read your constitution and know your rights. Know your rights because there's a lot of countries wish they had our constitution. And in our own country here, we got individuals that are trying to destroy that constitution because they don't want us to have rights. They want to be a dictatorship. And that's sad. And we need to fight for our rights. We've been doing it for over 200 years, and we should never, ever stop. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate coming down to get interviewed with us at Blood Money. Thank you, Vim. <laughs>